How's it going, everyone? Today we have a special guest in Ryan Tate. Ryan is the president of Veterans Empowered to Protect African Wildlife. Great to have you out here, Ryan. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. So before we start, uh, could you kind of describe and kind of give maybe like a little background of how you came to kind of create this incredible organization? Sure. Um, you know, I grew up in Florida. Um, I was in high school during 9-11. Um, I was sitting in English class and I, I, you know, watched it on the Twin Towers like many other people. And um, I wanted to do something about it. I had always wanted to go into the military. Um, I was leaning towards the Marine Corps because of some experiences that I had with Marines. And um, uh, I, I didn't grow up as the most confident kid out there. And, and the Marines just had this vibe about them that I really enjoyed. And and when 9-11 happened, it, it just, I wanted to get to the front lines as soon as possible as this gung-ho kid. And, and so I joined the Marine Corps. They got me to the front lines, um, served in combat. And long story short, um, it was the best and worst time of my life combined, but I wouldn't take it back for anything in the world. And, um, you know, my mother had always taught me growing up that, you know, take care of animals, treat animals and wildlife like you would want to be treated. And we had rescue dogs and cats. We had rescue horses. Um, I mean, you name it. My grandfather had a ranch in North Florida. And after I got out of the Marine Corps, I decided to uh, join the U.S. Department of State. I served on some uh, security details for some of America's top diplomats and foreign diplomats. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it just wasn't fulfilling. Um, I didn't feel like the experiences and the skills that I learned in combat were being utilized in the proper way. Now that doesn't mean that I took my job, I didn't take my job seriously, um, but I was content knowing that I'm probably gonna do this for the rest of my life. Um, the therapy that I was getting for my time at war was with animals in New York City, that was my, my field office. Um, I was going to local shelters and photographing the animals to help the adoption rate. Photography is a big hobby of mine, but that was the extent of my, right. um, my conservation work, I guess. And one day I, I came home on a, on a, uh, after work, watched a documentary on the Tusk Trust Foundation randomly and what the Royal family were doing to help with conservation. And I watched, um, typically when, if, if I can't control it, I don't want to see it. It, when it comes to animal abuse. And so right. I didn't know they were going to show this in this documentary, but they showed an elephant with its face completely ripped off. I mean, there's no eyeballs. There's nothing. It's right. ears and that's it. It's laying dead in the road. The trunk is separated from the body. Um, and it was horrifying. And then the next thing I know, I see rangers laying dead in a field. And I'm like, oh my God, people are dying now too. And then the gut punch was seeing a rhino that had been darted uh, by a tranquilizer. Poachers got a hold of tranquilizers. Tranquilizers don't go bang like a gun, so they could hit that animal. It goes down, hack its face off, be gone. Nobody even knows they're there. And that's what they did. And that animal ended up waking up and then dying a terrible death. Um, and I cried like a baby, not even gonna lie. I was embarrassed, humiliated. I was angry to say the least. And so I just started going to Africa on my own until the U S department of state said, Hey, you got to pick one or the other. And I had a <laughs> assistant secretary of state tell me that if uh, I didn't do it her way and stop what I'm doing, I won't have a job. And this was on a Friday. So Monday I turned in my resignation papers and, and said, well, you're not going to tell me that I can't go and fight for the innocent. And, um, Originally, I pushed it as a government proposal, but um, they didn't take it seriously. And right. uh, so I just went and did it myself. And I started, you know, going out and observing and training rangers and they were getting it. It was helping. And so I said, I need more veterans if I'm really going to make a measurable impact. And so I formed Fat Paul. Was there a fear, like obviously what you saw in those documentaries and your upbringing with animals, was there a fear though that, hey, I'm, I'm going to turn my resignation in, but you don't uh, you don't know if that's going to work out for you. So how did you overcome that fear and realize that you did make the right decision? You no, know, man, I was I was kind of blinded by passion, I guess. Um, I, I didn't think that there was there was no option. 
um, I was going to Africa and I was going to get involved. It was just a matter of how and at what capacity uh, that they would allow me to. So, you know, it's interesting because I've never, when you put it that way, I've never thought about it in that manner. Like, what if this didn't work? What if it failed? I just threw right you know, <laughs> years <laughs> of retirement out the window. I can't, you can't, once you leave, you know, right. the government, you're not getting back in. And uh, my family thought I was nuts. Like, what are you doing? You've got a dream job. And I'm like, no, it's. Well, it's one of those things, too, where uh, when I was the Secret Service, same type of people, why would you do that? But you could still do and love what you do and what you're trained to do. But there's other avenues with other departments or where you can put your skills to use where you feel like this more sense of pride and you're happy to do what you do. But you kind of control the situation now as much as you can. Yeah, you know, I think we get caught up too much, especially in American society, doing what we think we're supposed to do and not making waves. And, you know, we're obsessed with failure and because we, you know, you know, watch the news every day. All they do is highlight failure and nobody wants to fail, but it's like, you know, that's part of life. That's, that's how you live is it's all trial by error. And it's, it's all about learning from your mistakes. And, and luckily this wasn't a mistake. Right. <laughs> and, you know, we're seven years down the road and, and still cruising. So one of the cool things is that my CEO, Chris, he's a Marine veteran. And one of the, he adopts rescue horses, has a bunch of animals on his farm. And so I've got to understand that animals are therapeutic towards veterans with PTSD and people like that. And so for you to kind of combine the therapy for these veterans, while in turn, the veterans protecting animals, it's kind of a cool thing you got going on. And it's, was that kind of your approach when you jump out there and start building this team out? I'm glad that you brought that up because I, I, it's something that I haven't talked a lot about. When I started Vet Paul, my original goal was just to go and save animals and give veterans jobs. That that was which is awesome, which is yeah. badass. Right. But now down the road, and it, it took time to see this is these veterans. This is their lives now. These animals, they know their names, they know their behavior patterns. They are obsessed with it. I gave my team in Africa, which is there now an opportunity at the at the beginning of COVID to leave and said, hey, if you need to go be with your family, I totally, totally respect that. You'll have a job when you come back, but we'll bring you back. Not a single one left. They all stayed. They've been there since the start of COVID and they, they're not going to leave unless they know that that they can come back and, and protect these animals. So to see the, these veterans change and they have this new direction in life and it's one so pure, I, I, I don't there's very few things that you can do more pure than saving, you know, the innocent. So it's been, it's been cool to watch, um, the healing, um, right. Journey, I guess you would call it for the veterans. So individuals like yourself that do the tours, the combat and you're away from your families and friends and loved ones. So for these veterans to jump over here, this is store kind of mentally kind of still like a tour, obviously, cause you're away from your family, and loved ones, but, a lot of times people are like, well, it's not combat. Well, I do think you guys deal with situations over there. I'm not sure you can talk about half of it, that you're getting shot at. Like, this is still, this isn't like a vacation. This is hard work. And you were on paper, probably in a war zone, off paper, not a war zone. So, I mean, how does that, how do these families of these other veterans kind of deal with this where they're kind of, now you're gone again? You know, what's unique about, this new mission is is the families have become not just fans of the mission, but supporters and to see the pride that they have in their son or daughter now doing this new mission has been really cool. I know, you know, it does suck at times when you're away, you know, and you're missing, I can speak to it. You know, when you're deployed to Africa, is it a war zone like Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria? No, but you still miss life events. You're still, um, you still kind of get some of those feelings where you m miss, you know, home and feel like you're missing out. But at the end of the day, you know, you sit down and eat dinner and go out on a patrol next to elephants and rhinos. It's pretty freaking cool. So uh, I think it's it's unique to see the families kind of living uh, vicariously through their their uh, loved one, their veteran in, in Africa. And it's, it's it's really unique. Now, how has COVID affected you guys in terms of operations? Now, assuming that 
the bad guys don't care about COVID. They're still going to do their bad guy stuff. So for you guys, though, has this affected manpower or anything where you guys can't get the resources you need? Yeah, so a big way that we fund our operations is, is ecotourism. We have a program where people can pay it's cheaper than anywhere else in Africa, but you get the most incredible experience to come spend time with our veterans. You get an exclusive safari experience. Um, it's really cool, but we had to we had to totally stop that the relaunch of that program, and that's you know that's everything. Um, so funding has completely. It hasn't completely stopped, but in terms of the ecotourism, it has. Manpower, um, yeah, we we were supposed to have a whole other team there right now, so that's tough. Um, our aerial, um, yeah, I can say this, but our, our aerial surveillance stuff is, has kind of slowed down a little bit, so we've had to, because of funding, right. so we've had to resort to some other more unique ways to get the job done. Um, but if anything, I think this has made us a stronger organization because we're still here and a lot of a lot of organizations can't even get to Africa anymore. So right. it's like, what do you do? Do you even have a company if you're not going over there? And, and I, I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's the fact you guys are actually able to still be out there and do your thing is quite a testament to what you have established. Now, if I'm a veteran or I go to your website or wherever I reach out, hey, and what's the process of kind of, I mean, you just can't accept anyone, right? So there has to be some sort of protocol or background. Like, how do you guys pick and choose kind of who makes it that far? Yeah, it's it's a great job for the right veterans. But if you don't have the right mindset, it's we're not going over there to, you know. Fight insurgents. Yeah, that's not it. I right. mean, you're 100% a conservationist when you first when you go out there. Um, so we developed, um, with the help of my director of operations and his other company, which is um, Six Layer Concepts, we developed um, a selection course for two weeks. Veterans fly themselves to the Arizona desert. We pick them up at the airport. We birth them. We feed them, all that stuff. So it's all taken care of. Um, and they try out. They go through physical fitness tests in the desert. They go through a medical course, shooting, uh, land navigation, night navigation, um, team building. Uh, we do it all. We want to make sure that their skills are up to date. They get a wildlife course, obviously. Um, and uh, at the end of it, they either get a certificate of completion or they're not going to be asked to be on the team because one bad apple can screw it all up. And I love my veterans, but it's this is not the right job for every veteran out there right like in the security industry we employ a ton of veterans we work with a bunch of groups like Skillbridge to help marines kind of transition into the civilian life and uh nine times out of ten they're all great you always have that one person that is very they don't uh in my industry customer service and people skills are so it's will save lives and i don't want the guy that's gonna punch first or shoot first i want the guy that's able to kind of assess the situation to go with it. So I, I, tell, I believe that you kind of deal with the same situation with some people that think this is, we're going to be shooting poachers all day. We're going to be like going after stuff. And the fact that you aren't like that is even that more incredible. Yeah. One thing we run into a few times is you get these guys that do it for their social media accounts. And it's like, Hey, you know, this job is not to, uh, it's not to boost your confidence. You can do that on your own time. You know, we need people that are, you know, could care less about being an influencer or whatever it may be. but Right. And it's one of those fine lines, too, where you need the people to show support. But at what point does that start really become – like, I assume if I'm a bad guy, I, if I'm people are geotagging pictures, I can start to trace the location of animals, what area they're in, and who's watching at what time, right? Yeah, 100%. You can take that metadata. You can do a lot of exploitation with it. So that's a lot of stuff you guys, besides the physicality of it, you're working with. I know you can't talk about all the stuff with like surveillance and stuff, but you must be able to work with some really cool equipment and gear that really helps your jobs that much easier. Yeah, it, the stuff that we do have, yes, and we are in the midst of bringing on a whole new um, program with some of the geotag stuff and the metadata that we can manipulate. Um, I, I can't speak too much about it yet. Right. But I hope to at some point because it is an incredible system um, that we're looking to implement. 
So in terms of on-the-job training, like in between missions or you're in Africa, do these men and women have the opportunity to do some shooting drills, maybe work on some scenario-based training and stuff like that? A hundred percent. So I, I typically let my team leaders do their job. Um, I just give them the oversight that's necessary. Um, so if we, we can direct them on some training, but we do facility training, we do, we do all, all that stuff. We have ranges, everything in Africa. Um, vehicle training, you'd be surprised how many veterans can't even drive a stick shift vehicle now. It's <laughs> mind blowing, man. <laughs> right. I mean, there's plenty of space there for a three point turn for sure. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, we're, we're always trying to get into training. It's tough with COVID, right? Uh, South Africa shut down, but but yeah, we're always trying to get refresher stuff done. And how, if you could kind of touch on how vast of an area you guys are responsible for, like you look at the map and people are like, oh, it's a big area, but no, this is a big, big area. How big really is it? Oh, you know, it. so we we help patrol several different parks that butt up against each other. Right. Um, so I live in Salt Lake City and our sanctuary is bigger than Salt Lake City. I mean, it is huge. It is oh, massive. Jeez. So it's if you want to find, you know, a poacher, it can be, you know, typically when I started going to Africa in the beginning, they were just like, hey, we'll go patrol over there today because we haven't been there in a while. It's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Right. No and, intelligence based right. operations. Right. And you could you could watch your team like clockwork. Oh, they're in the east sector. We'll be in the west killing everything. Yeah, pretty much. Fascinating stuff. So you touched on these other kind of parks and buddy heads together. Is there any issues with them against each other for ego or type of stuff like that? Or do you find that everyone's in this game to win it together? So when it, when it comes to the parks that we work in, no, we don't have any issues, but it's honestly, it's Americans and it's, it's non-African smaller NGOs that, you know, we didn't start, I didn't go to college to, to become a conservationist. I'm a conservationist by, you know, just by default. Um, but you get these people that now it's, it is ego driven and you see it a lot in conservation in animal welfare of any sector. Um, it's about being the first person to save the last subspecies of this animal or this. I don't, I don't really, to be frank with you, I don't really give a shit who saves the animal, just save it. Right. save the species. Um, I've given up an entire life, left it behind, given up hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this. So it's, it has nothing to do with, with my ego here. I just, I just genuinely do this because I want to save the animal and so do all my guys. But yeah, you get some crazy stuff. I mean, I've had people, I've had death threats. I've had people throw my character <laughs> just in the wash, man, crazy stuff. But uh, it doesn't doesn't deter us. It never will. Yeah, know? one of the reasons why I reached out to you initially is that I was doing a deep dive and uh, I wanted to learn about wildlife conservation. And uh, our, my friend Andrea Crosta, Earth League International, talking with him about it, and then we, other organizations. And someone had posted this picture of I think it's something something wide to know about one of those white tigers that they inbreed, whatever, to make like this animal that obviously is not natural. And the people are like, well, I found that they, they tagged your company, like Jane Godell, uh, and a bunch of other companies that I, these are world renowned. And these people are very, they're vile. They're like, these people don't care about the animals. It's all about social media and taking your money. It's like, well, hold on a second. At what point did people that want to protest, whether it's PETA or they're, they're worse than the actual people committing the crimes sometimes. And for you guys to kind of push forward and keep, keep adhering to your mission and your mission statement. Like it's a testament that I don't think a lot of people understand what you guys have to go through mentally and physically, but to see that in a public forum with some of these people, mind you, this is a small percentage of assholes, but for you guys to deal with that, it's, it's, it's gotta be like just nauseating because you're still a human yeah. at the end of the day, but this is a company that is a charity that is working with veterans. Like you, you're, you're doing so much, for what cause and to have someone kind of go at you like that. It just, it made me sick. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny too. Cause like some of these guys are actual veterans that are spreading this stuff. And it's like, 
I've well, got, probably because those are the guys that couldn't make the team because they're not ready actually to one talk. of them. Yeah, he did. He didn't. He spent like eleven months in the Navy, and and we didn't give him an invite. So I guess he took it offense to it. But it's like nothing I can do. But yeah, he went around telling people I, I have Ferraris and Lamborghinis and three houses. I live in a two bedroom house uh, uh, apartment complex in Utah. I haven't had a car in eight years because I sold it when I started this organization, right. and I share a car with my wife. Like we're not poor by any means, but come on, man, don't, don't start spreading that. Right. But the fact you're able to kind of stay the cause though, it's a testament to yourself and your character. And uh, it's great that you're, you're doing it. Well, I appreciate you recognizing that. And I don't care. They can say all they want about me. Just, just leave my guys alone. That's all I care about. One of the uh, interesting things I'm kind of curious about, if you're dealing with back home, if I'm wherever I'm at, a deer, you get deer tags, they're a nuisance animal. If you have crops, you're a farmer, and you could tag, shoot, kill, whatever. So I don't – when people are in another country, like, why are you shooting the deer? Like, I'd be like, well, hold on. Do you know the facts? And so – but on the flip side of that, when you hear of big game hunters, trophy hunters doing their thing, like, I'm not for it, obviously. But then you hear of the local people talking about, well, this elephant killed my crop and knocked down my fence, went through my huts. Now, now I'm kind of like – well, now I get why they're pissed and why they want to kill an elephant. They don't see yeah. the animal like like I I would and sympathize with. Why are you killing that animal? So how do you guys kind of navigate that? It's tough because we get we we try to ride that fence. We're not a pro hunting or anti hunting organization. We're a conservation and pro counter uh, poaching organization. However, you know I think anybody that shoots an elephant or a rhino, I mean. I don't understand it. How I, hard is that, honestly? I mean, I couldn't even imagine trying to put myself in that mindset to squeeze a trigger at one of those animals or a giraffe, whatever. Um, but the the challenge is this, and I, and a lot of people that are are vegan and pro animals, and I love vegans, they're cool. Um, think that it's all a joke and it's just smoke and mirrors, but it's not. In South Africa, in many places in the southern hemisphere of Africa there are fences around these massive reserves. Kruger National Park is larger than Israel. Right. And it's in three countries. It's a tri-country, uh, uh, transnational park. And there's a fence around the entire thing. When you put fences around reserves, what if we put a fence around all of Manhattan? People are just going to keep reproducing and nonstop. And then you got, an, you got an imbalance in that ecosystem. And then you lose your most endangered species. We were on a park that had 6,000 too many impala. And they were and they were multiplying. It was doubling right. every year. So if we don't allow hunters to come in and take down some of those impala ethically, then we will lose all of the animal, all the food for rhinos, elephants, you name it. Everything becomes unbalanced. So it's like, pick your poison here. What do you want? Do you want a continent full of impala, or do you want a diverse ecosystem with elephants, rhinos, and less impala? Like. You know, it's not really my place. I let the biologists do their thing. I'm not right. a hunter, but I'm not going to. It's the same as deer hunting here in the States. It's right. Antelope. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating that people will just assume the worst and not realize that, hey, there's a reason why these animals are being hunted. Um, it is for conservation, and it does a lot more good than uh, – because I know back up in New Northeast – North America, like when the wolf population started increasing, the coyote population, people are like, well, why are you going to shoot them? Well, they're overpopulated, and now you're affecting the food chain where different stuff kills. And it's, so it's kind of, it's very fascinating that uh, people actually research and do a deep dive on what they're trying to talk about. I think they really understand that, that like, yeah. this, there's good hunting out there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's as long as it's ethical. And it's done appropriately. You know, I don't want to be involved with it on any level, but I don't have any issues with it. I mean, it's when you have different eating behaviors, you have different gestation periods, and you don't allow these animals to migrate with the rains, then you have to do what you have to do. And it sucks because it's almost like playing God. But at the end of the day, too, if, if you eat meat from the grocery store and you're knocking people that are, you know, shooting deer, that's that, that's such a... Right. <laughs> At least those deer are in cages, right? Yeah, it's like you were literally born to die, you know. So, right. which is a whole other topic. Um, in terms of if there's new trends that come out, whether it's an uh, animal, it's 
get close to being on the dangerous species list or vice versa or migratory stuff, where are you getting your information? Like, how are you always kind of learning and adapting? So it's we we typically rely on the subject matter experts within conservation. We have one of the most world renowned veterinarians that only works. He's the only veterinarian that works with our elephants, rhinos, and endangered species. We have biologists and ecologists that come in and they analyze these things quarterly. These reserves and they're massive. They spend like they're on the ground, camping out in the bush, watching, looking, aerial surveillance from the helicopter. To, they do counts on every species. It's it's hard, hard work. Um, and our guys are helping with the counts and, and assisting. I mean, these are real conservationists. They are are literally the right and left hands of the veterinarian or the biologist. It's it's super cool. But um, and it also depends on CITES and what they dictate, um, you know, which is a whole other topic as well. But, um, you know, it, it, it depends on the subject matter experts. Right. And in terms of your team that's on site, what their what is their like? What's like a basic day consist of? Now I'm not. This isn't assuming that there's an issue where this poacher's on site, but this is like say a regular Tuesday. How do they set up their patrols? Like you don't obviously can't get specific for reasons, sure. but like what does their day consist of? Sure. So the operations tempo it obviously flexes a lot right. um, in different directions. Um, there's camera traps that we have to monitor. They're logging data a lot of times. Uh, they're checking fence voltage and things like that because this, the fences aren't just to keep animals in, it's to keep people out. Um, they're checking vehicles. So full moon time is our, our heaviest time. That's when poaching picks up. So when That's full an actual moon, full moon? Yes, full moon. Okay. Yep. Because you don't need a flashlight in the bush. It's like... You ever you ever gone into a combat zone and worn you know MBGs when you got a full moon? Right. It's, right. it's it's it hurts your eyes. I mean, you don't need it. Um, so it's very similar. Um, you don't even need a flashlight, so it, it makes it easier to to get around for poachers. So the guys are working around the clock. I mean, it's a very tiring time. Um, so that'll last for about ten days usually. Wow. Um, the full cycle, uh, and then outside of that, uh, moving animals. We relocate animals to and from other ecosystems to help build the bloodlines more. Um, we just recently relocated two massive bull tusker elephants from Zimbabwe awesome. into the reserve. So that was super cool. Um, do these animals, do you think, I mean, I know they have feelings and when I see videos of animals crying, it, like it, it gets to me. And I know we talked about earlier, we kind of laughed. Like if I see two animals get hurt or an animal get hurt, I'm more apt to save a, animal getting hurt than I, if I see a human getting hurt. And that's not to say I'm not a protector type, but for every reason, I, when I see animals, they're so defenseless. And when you guys kind of, do you think these animals realize why you're there? Or is it one of those things where they get so used to you guys, your presence, that they're not afraid of you guys? You know, I think, I think some animals have more intuition in – an emotional presence than we realize elephants for instance um yeah they do get used to the vehicles um they know the difference between they know our trucks they don't run from them if a random vehicle comes in they may they'll probably run from it so yeah i i do think though that that some of the animals know why our guys are there um right. I, I think so i'd like to think so Right. Well, it's me. I think when they recognize you with the cars or the people, like they know there's a there's a sense of calmness here where it's we're not going to be chased. Like they are here for us. I mean, I think it'd be cool that if we could somehow get in the mind of an animal what they are thinking, because uh, they know when their siblings or family gets killed. Like there's, that's studies are out there where they know someone's dead or missing. Like they, they still cry out like a parent would or a child would, and it's quite fascinating. You guys are kind of in that world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, in the event that there is something that goes on in terms of, hey, we got poachers here, we're working with the park rangers, we, we, we get them pertained. Once you apprehend these poachers, if that's something you guys, if you could talk about it, but now you have to deal with local law enforcement and stuff. So, how do you guys kind of like the chain of custody in terms of dealing with the event and then making sure they get punished with. And again, are you dealing with corruption on different sides of it too, where 
there's certain people that get money to kind of turn the blind eye for some of the stuff. Yeah, you know, I get the corruption question a lot. I've dealt with it, but it's more from political appointees or Which you know, makes publicly sense. elected officials. Um, when it comes to the police, obviously there's corrupt guys. The, the head ranger at Kruger last year, two years ago, got nailed for having tons right. of rhino hornets. It's, it's crazy. So it's out there and it exists. But, you know, on the local level of police departments that we work with, uh, we haven't had issues in a long time. As a matter of fact, we've done some training for their um, their counter uh, counter terrorist teams before, and and um, you know, Lynn, my director of operations, uh, has been doing some human behavior pattern recognition and human terrain mapping that they can use elsewhere. Um, so we have a great relationship with the local police department. Um, they're understaffed and they can't be everywhere, so we're a big help to them. You know, when, in terms of a federal level government, what's their priority? Is it going to be animals or the people? It's mostly the people. So that doesn't mean cops don't care about the animals, but it's nice for them to have some assistance. Right. But um, if our guys, if our team uh, apprehends a poacher, we do an interview with them. Um, but we help sort through the evidence and make and help the police department build a case to then present to a judge. And it's up to the judge. We actually had a huge day yesterday, three big time. Uh, rhino kingpin poachers uh, were given, I want to say, 10 years in prison. Awesome. Like that. Yeah, and that's not a fun prison to be in. Um, yeah, I can imagine. That's worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of other groups that are out there, like Vetpa, uh, they don't have to be veterans per se, but are there is there any ego out there if you guys come across other teams or like what's the how does it break down in terms of jurisdiction if can one team be helping one park but also be at your park area helping like how does that work uh we just keep open lines of communication anybody we work with we we haven't had any issues with with groups that are on the ground it's it's usually those that that think that you know if i tear down this organization and steal their donors and their 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 support their base of supporters then we'll just naturally grow. That's not how you build a nonprofit. Right. Um, but no, we, we haven't had any issues. We donate a lot of gear and, and things and a lot of manpower and hours of manpower to other groups, anything that we can do to help, whether it's us training them or them training us. I mean, if you're an African, there are things, our guys learn just as much from Rangers as Rangers learn from our guys. So everybody seems to think it's veterans going over there waving the American flag to lead the way. We don't, I don't even let my guys wear American flags. We're there to to um, to support. We're not there to lead the way. Sometimes it's, we do lead the way, but... And again, it's very interesting how you have two groups of people help each other out, understand cultures and helping. You have the animals helping the veterans, and both groups helping the animals. It's you, You've created this really cool atmosphere where you're making a difference, but also making a difference in the lives of the people that are actually working for that Mm-hmm. A hundred percent. So cool, man. So how do people kind of reach out if they want to donate, if they want to kind of just get involved in the sense of, hey, social media and stuff like that? Like, how do they be involved with you guys? Sure. So we have vetpaw.org.org. That's, um, that's our website. We've got donation platforms there. Um, we also, you know, sometimes we need equipment and things, things that like drones or um, optics, all kinds of things. If, if you think it can help in a combat zone, there's a good chance it can help um, our guys or a ranger team in Africa. So that's always helpful. Um, we've got our social media. If you want to check out some of the videos that, that the guys are taking every day, we upload a lot of camera trap footage, which is really cool. Um, you can check us out at that Paul on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, I think we have a TikTok. I don't mess with TikTok, but, but we have a TikTok as well. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if the animals are part of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I always say, you know, if you don't have the money to donate it, what is your top skill? If you can knit, you can make something that we could sell or auction off. It, just find out what you're good good at and find it we'll find a way to apply it no i love that man i want to thank you for this because it's very fascinating and uh i think a lot of people can be kind of blown away by your organization and whatever we can do on our end through our socials and reach out to the people and artists and stuff we work with to kind of get the, the, the your concept out there i'm more than happy to do that well we really appreciate the opportunity man and and uh would love to keep in touch and and uh 
and keep you up to date on the progress. Yeah, I love it. I want to thank you, Ryan. And, uh, be safe. Enjoy uh, your Thanksgiving. And uh, here's to a better 2021. <laughs> Likewise. Thanks, John. Thank you.